exponential functions. The NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament begins with 64 teams and consists of six rounds. So I'm just going to go ahead and highlight important information here. The winners from each round play against each other in the second round. The winners then move from the Sweet 16 to the Elite 8 and to the Final Four and finally to the Championship game. How many winners are there in the first round? Well, every team, every one of the 64 teams is going to be matched up against another team. So there will be Team 1 plays Team 2, Team 3 plays Team 4, 5 plays 6, and there's going to be a total of 32 games. Again, each game consists of two people for a total of 64 teams. So how many winners are there in the first round? Well, if there's 32 teams and, sorry, 32 games and each game can only consist of one winner, there would be 32 winners in the first round. After each round, how has the number of teams changed? So now in the second round, instead of having 64 teams and 32 games, Remember, 64 teams, 32 games. Now we're going to have 32, 32 teams and only 16 games because each game consists of two teams. So what happened here? We went from, and we're talking about number of teams, okay? We went from 64 teams down to 32 after the first round because half the teams lost. We divided by two half the number of teams exist. And maybe we can have a little bit easier time if we look at this little chart here. In the first round, we have 64 teams, a number of 32 games, because it takes two teams to make one game. Now in the second round, instead of having 64 teams, we have 32 teams, and that would consist of 16 games, two teams per game. Then we have in the Sweet 16, Sweet 16, um, we have 16 teams for eight games. In the Elite Eight, we have eight teams for four games. Final Four, again, four games, oh, sorry, four teams two games. And did I match this up? Did I put the number wrong here? Let's see here. We have 64, uh, 32 games, 64 teams. Then we have 16 games, needs 32 teams. And we have 8, so we need 16. Then we have 4. Oh, there's, so we have 4, so we need 8 teams to make 4 games. We have 2 games, we need 4. And then we have Again, watch how the pattern goes. 32, 16, 8, 4, 2. Two teams, one. Two teams. Number of games. So this is actually the national championship game. All right, so keep this in mind. Please take a second. Write this down. I'm going to put it on pause. Please take a second. Write this down. We're going to use this when we create a function to represent this data in just a second. So how many winners were there in the first round? Okay, number of games, 32 games in the first round. Again, only one winner per game, 32. After each round, how has the number of teams changed? Number of teams, 64, 32, 16. After each additional round, the number of teams is cut in half. After each additional round, the number of teams is cut in half, or half the number of teams exist after each round. Before I start C, notice that for 64 teams, it takes six rounds to play and find the winner. Again, 64 teams, it takes six rounds until we have one game and one winner of this entire NCAA tournament. Now, part C says, let's make a prediction. If the tournament field were reduced from 64 to 32, so when the tournament starts, there is only 32 teams that exist, how many basketball games would it have to be played by the tournament 
uh, to find a winning team. So now, instead of starting with 64, we start with 32. So this is the starting point. So the, really, this is round one. We have 32 teams. This is round one, round two, round three, round four, and round five. So it would be one last round, one last round in order to find a winning team. So five complete rounds. Write a function for the number of teams remaining in the tournament after x rounds. Now we're going to underline this, here, this or highlight this. Again, our function wants to represent the number of remaining, the number of remaining teams in the tournament. In order to do that, you learn about exponentials. You learn about exponentials at the very beginning. Uh, excuse me, it's midway through freshman year, and, and so we're going to go back here and we are going to review this. So this function right now is y equals, and this first number is going to represent your initial amount. So we're starting with the 64 that's mentioned up above, 64 teams. Instead of percent parentheses will be the rate. So the rate that goes from one round to the next round, representing the number of teams. One round to the next. And again, we've already noticed from one round to the next, the number of teams is cut in half. And now x exponential. So let's just make sure this works. If I substitute 0 in for x, representing, before we even get started here, 0. So anything raised to the 0 is 1. 1 times 64 is 64. 64 is my first answer. Now if I place a 1 in here instead of a 0, 1 half raised to the first power is 1 half. And half of 64 is 32. You could put a 2 in here. You could put a 2 in here and distribute. You'd have 1 squared over 2 squared. 1 squared over 2 squared. 1 over 4. Again, if I place a 2 into this position, I'd have 1 squared over 2 squared. So 1 fourth times 64. 1 fourth times 64. 64 over 4 is 16. And we can see again our next round here. This is 0. This is our initial round. Our next round would be 16. This is 0. It's our very beginning. This is 1. This is 2. Use a graphing calculator to graph this function. Then state the domain and range. Notice that this is different than what we have. Keep that in mind. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to substitute in 2 to the x. And oops, excuse me here. I want to take out what was previously in there. Give me one second. I'm going to clear it, and now 2 to the x. And I've heard some of you describe this as a j curve that you learned freshman year. Okay, This is 2 to the x. Now let's see what we have. We don't have that. We have 1 half raised to the x. And remember this red curve here, this red function, if we look at it, it's going to tell us the number of teams remaining after a specific amount of rounds. The number of teams remaining after a specific amount of rounds. And for our particular problem, we have a 64 out front, a 1 half, and again we're going to raise it to the x. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here before I go back and answer this question. Okay. And I'm going to raise this up so we can see the whole thing. What you see in blue is an example of exponential growth. As you move to the right, it is growing exponentially. And in this case, it is being doubled. Now what you see in red is the actual problem we worked with today. It's exponential decay. And again, at any point, I could plug it in. Our initial value, so at zero, when we're starting this tournament, excuse me, I wanted to go to the red. When we're starting this tournament, I have 64 teams. After the first round is done, I have 32 teams. After the second round is done, there are 16 teams remaining. And this allows us to model the information we have. OK, let's go back and say again, with this, this is growth, not the decay that we see this problem. With this growth, what is the domain, the range, and the end behavior? So let's look back to the blue. What is the growth? Excuse me, what is the domain range and end behavior? Okay, so this is what we have, graphing what we have here. 
And if you need just a little bit of a review here, I'm looking at the blue, so I'll take away the green so there's no confusion. When I look here, you're like, I don't see a number in front like we have 64. It's a hidden one. Whatever this number is in front is going to be your y-intercept. Also notice that it appears like this blue line is going to overlap the x-axis. Not true. In fact, unless we have some type of transition that shifts this thing down, this will never cross the x-axis. So the domain, there's no limit how far it goes to the left. And as it rises up, there's no limit how far it goes to the right. The range, now it never touches, this is in terms of y value, it never touches the x-axis. So I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to leave it as a parenthesis, it never touches that. And there's no limit how high it goes. End behavior, we haven't worked with that in a little while. And whatever you put the x's in front or in backs, as long as they're going to correspond to the correct description of the y, it doesn't matter. As I go to the far left, what is it approaching? I may not touch it, but what is it approaching? As I go to the far left, it is approaching 0. And as I go to the far right, it is approaching positive and and now number three, we can see this is an example here of growth, and this is an example of decay. So this is like the problem we worked with, not the specific problem, but the problem we worked with. And this is going to be our general formula for either. Now how do we tell if it's going to be growth or if it's decay? If this B value is greater than 1, if this B value is greater than 1, we know it is growth. If this B value is between 0 to 1, we know it is decay. What does that A represent that's in front of both? It represents your starting point, your starting point. Once again, for the problem we talked about in number one, our starting point for the number of teams was 64. Graphing calculator, graph the functions on the same screen and describe how the shapes compare. So I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to start with x to the third and one third to the third. Now, if we compare that to what we see here, I see, okay, this three is greater than one, so this must be a growth. One third is between zero and one, so it must be decay. But in either case, I don't see, I'm going to adjust the window for one second. We don't need to go all the way up to 64. So I'm going to go back to window and change this to the natural 10. But what I don't see is a number in front. Does that mean no number exists? No, it does exist. But what it means is that it's a hidden one. So in both cases, we can see that they cross the y-intercept point. So how do the shapes compare? Well, they're actually reflections across the y-axis. They're reflections across the y-axis. So they're symmetrical over the y-axis. If we folded right along this line, they would be identical. And how do the asymptotes and the y-intercepts compare? Again, we have the same y-intercept. And we could see that before we even graphed it. There's a hidden one in front and a hidden one in front. Those represent the y-intercepts. The asymptotes in both cases, because we have not shifted this up or down, we have a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. Remember, the horizontal asymptote of the x-axis, it's horizontal. So it's y equals 0. That is your horizontal asymptote. We do have the same y-intercepts for both. Y-intercept would be 0, 1. Describe the relationships of the graph. We can see that the rates are 3 and 1 third. So they're reciprocals of one another and having the exact same, having the exact same starting point or y-intercept and having reciprocals of the rate or the B value in this original equation makes them symmetrical across the Y. Using a graphing calculator, graph the functions on the same screen. Then compare the graphs and list both the similarities and differences, the shapes, asymptotes, ranges, and y-intercepts. So I'd like you to do that for A, B, C, D, and E. So I'm going to clear off what I have right now. And I'm going to start with 2 to the x, excuse me, 2 to the x. And it's nice with our new graphing calculators that we'll, we will be able to differentiate each graph based on the color. So this is going to be blue, red, and black. And just for myself, I'm going to go blue, red, and black. Okay, so let's go up here. We're going to compare the graph. So I can see as the 2, 3, and 4, as the rates increase, 
so does the rate moving from left to right as our graph increases. All of these represent growth, exponential growth, because we're rising from left to right. And again, as your B value increases, so does the rate at which your function increases going from left to right. All have the same general shape. Uh, Ms. Castro describes it as a J curve. Uh, they're all growth again because 2, 3, and 4 all greater than 1. Now, where are they similar? We don't see a number in front of a starting point. All of them have a starting point of 1. There's a hidden 1, 1, and 1 in front, and we can see they all cross the same y-intercept, 0, 1. Um, they all have the exact same asymptote. Although it appears like they touch or cross the x-axis, that is not the case. This has not been shifted up or down. They all have an asymptote of y equals zero. The domain and range are going to be the same. Okay, They all go from negative infinity to positive infinity for the domain. No limit how far it goes to left or right. The ranges are also all the same as well. Remember they don't touch the zero. That's why we're going to do a parenthesis and there's no limit how high it goes. Y intercepts again are all the same. As I go through this, please make sure you're writing down the answers as I'm describing. So I get to come back up here and I get to change that two to a one half raised the x and come down here and one third raised the x and one fourth raised to the x. Now what have I done essentially from a to b? I've taken the reciprocal and notice that all of these here have a b value or rate that is between 0 to 1 so they are all going to be exponential decay, which means from left to right, that's how we read the graphs, it's going to be going down. It's like that j-curve has flipped across the y-axis. It's flipped across. Or again, we read from left to right. So let's describe They all have an exponential decay. decay. They're all going down from left to right. Similarly, they all have the same y-intercept of 0, 1. We could see that looking at the graphs, 1, hidden 1, and hidden 1. Uh, now, how do we know the same thing? This is blue. This is red and this is black. How do we know which one appears to go down faster? And this is, if you look up here, it seems like black is decreasing at the fastest rate. I meant to put black here. Black is decreasing at the fastest rate. So when I look at my numbers, what is the largest value on the inside? One half. So if I like, if you prefer decimals, this is 0.5, this is 0.3 repeating, and 0.25. Let's do an estimation. If I change this and I make it um, a one tenth, so that's a point, that's a point one, which is smaller than the other three, what's going to happen? What can we predict would happen? So let's look at the purple. We can see the purple decreases even faster. So the smaller the rate between zero to one, the faster it's going to decrease from left to right. We're going to have similar, um, similar domains here, no limit how far it goes to left and right. Um, now ranges are a little bit different. It comes from the far left and there's no limit how far it goes to the far left. But as it goes to the right, it approaches zero, never touching it. Again, we have all the same y-intercepts of zero. Can your prediction what's going to happen in part C. Now what's the only difference? The only difference now is instead of A and B, we didn't have a number up front that we could see. Now we have a number, but the number has changed. One is positive and one is negative. So within your group, as I plug this in, I'd like you to make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen? What have you learned about the numbers out front being positive or negative? Again, blue is my negative and red is my positive. Okay, blue is going to go down, red is going to go up. Notice again that we have a 2 here. So it's growth. It's going to make this curve. Now what changes it going down? It's going to, whenever we have a negative out front, you've learned this previ previously when we've described um, translations of functions. When there's a negative out front, it reflects across the x-axis. So we've taken this particular graph by adding a negative out front. It just now reflects across the x-axis. That's the only difference and how these are created. Um, let's look at what their y-intercepts are. This has a y-intercept of positive 3. This has a y-intercept of negative 3. For their domain, in red, which is your exponential growth, 
Okay, we are going to go from negative infinity to positive infinity. And um, when we look at the range, there are going to be different ranges here. So the range is, it comes from the far left, which looks like it's approaching zero, it doesn't touch it. And as it goes to the far right, it is going to go, there's no limit how far it moves to the far right. Remember this with, um, let's go back here for, I don't want to make a mistake here, for domain. Let's just talk about one at a time, domain. No limit how far it goes to the left, no limit how far it goes to the right. For the red graph, as low as it goes is zero. It approaches zero but never touches. There's no limit how high it goes. Now for the blue, no limit how far it goes to the left, no limit how far it goes to the right. But for the range, there's no limit how low it goes, but it does come up and approach zero, never actually touching zero. You may want to go back and watch that. A little more confusing, okay? Differentiating, differentiating the two. And we've already talked what the y-intercepts are, and the shapes, again, is reflected across the x-axis. What's the difference between C and D? Well, here's a negative one, and here's a positive one. There's no difference. In C, in both cases, we have exponential growth. One is just reflected across the x-axis. Same thing here. Both exponential growth, because 2 is greater than 1. This is reflected across the x-axis. So I can come back in here, and I can change this to a negative 1 and to a positive 1. Again, my negative 1 will be blue, and my positive 1 will be red. Please put this right now on pause, and I'd like you to identify the y-intercepts of both, the domain, the range, and the asymptotes. Then continue on with the video my blue function. So I'm going to start with domain. No limit how far it goes to the left and to the right. The range comes from comes from the bottom. No limit how far it goes and it approaches zero, never touching zero. There is going to be that horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. It never crosses that line. Now for the red, the domain, no limit how far it goes to the left and right. The range it comes from zero, never touching it. It moves up, no limit how, far, how high it goes. And we have the exact same horizontal asymptote. It never crosses the line, x equals zero, even though it appears like that on your graph. Now the y-intercept for the red is going to be zero, one. For the blue is going to be zero, negative one. Again, we've just taken this graph and we've attached on a reflection over the x-axis exactly this in part E. We've described the relationship. We took an exponential growth. Now we attach it in a translation of reflecting across the x-axis, and that's what we have in this graph. Please write that in words, in your own understanding.